Hello and welcome to Christmas Characters. Christmas Characters is a series that is supposed to be a survey of about six different uh, characters that are prominent in the story concerning and surrounding the birth of Jesus. Uh, in this season, as we mark the birth of Jesus, I do know that in certain quarters, there is still the debate over whether it is appropriate for uh, Christians and believers to celebrate Christmas. And some persons would even say it is okay to celebrate the birth of Jesus, but probably not on the 25th of December, because uh, probably because of the origins of how Christmas came to be celebrated on the 25th of December or for some persons it's because they believe it has been hijacked by uh, the world and so there is probably a lot of materialistic component to the way that celebration happens and it's been bastardized and all of that. Now I am aware of all of those different sides of the argument but I do believe that charity is key in dealing with matters like this. Um, as one of the church fathers have said, in the essentials, unity, in the non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Those that would observe days should be allowed to do so, so long as they do so in a way that is honoring to God. And those that do not intend to observe any kind of days should also be free to do so without any of these parties uh, basically talking down on the other or making the other party feel uh, unspiritual or uh, paganistic or completely lacking in gratitude so that if you celebrate you shouldn't be made to feel like you are participating in a pagan culture, particularly if you do it with the reference that is appropriate and with the joy that is supposed to be attendant to celebrating the birth of Jesus. And if you do not, you should also not be denigrated for not celebrating um, as being ungrateful so much that you do not even want to celebrate the birth of the one that died in order to save you. I'm basically saying that those that would celebrate Christmas should have the freedom and the liberty actually to go ahead and do so, so long as they are, they are actually marking and celebrating the birth of Jesus. And those that do not intend to celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus or that do not intend to celebrate it on the 25th of December, as it is done in most part of the world, should also be free to go ahead uh, with non-celebrations. Now, having said that, I want to get straight to the first installment of this series, which we have called Characters of Christmas. The idea is there are different characters that are prominent in the Christmas story, beginning from, of course, God himself, but I wouldn't be looking at God in that regard. So we'll start basically from the angels that were involved in the story and the narrative of Christmas, starting from the fact that an angel was the one that brought Mary news of the fact that she was going to conceive and she was going to give birth to a child and his name would be called Jesus. Angels were very critical and very prominent around the Christmas story. Apart from coming to Mary to give her news of the soon arrival of Jesus and the fact that that uh, child was going to be born by her, uh, it was an angel too that appeared to uh, a Joseph in a dream to let Joseph know that what was happening with Mary was also uh, divine. An angel appeared at that same period, actually before Mary's encounter with the angel. An angel also had appeared unto Zacharias, who went on to be the father of John the Baptist, who went on then to become the forerunner of Jesus. When Jesus was eventually born, there were angels that were taking care of their flock in the night. And the Bible says that an angel of the Lord had appeared unto them. And with that angel was a multitude, the host of heavenly beings, uh, a host of, uh, of angels that came alongside that angel as they celebrated and basically lit the sky uh, in celebration of the one that had been born. Whenever you talk about angels, there is um, expectedly 
like two extremes that people are very, very prone to adopting. So there's the extreme that is an angel obsession. That is, uh, there's an extreme where people can be in, inordinately, inordinately enthralled and obsessed with uh, angels and the world of angels. And so you see people who pray to angels or pray through angels and go into calling all kinds of names, identifying angels that are actually foreign to scripture. And then you, you see people talking to angels and sending angels up and down and all of that. On the other extreme is a complete nonchalance towards the realm of angels and the reality of angels. Both extremes are to be avoided by Christians. And depending on your, um, your tradition, your Christian tradition, by that I mean depending on your denominational affiliation, you will most likely gravitate towards one of these extremes. Either you, you, you would belong in the extreme where angels are seen uh, to be an integral part of everything that happens. And every time that you come for uh, a Christian meeting or a gathering of believers, there would be that intense obsession with angels. Or, on the other hand, you might be on the other extreme where practically nothing is said or known about angels. So that um, it's almost as if they are a non-existent part of the world in which we inhabit. Like I said earlier on, both of those extremes are wrong. When we, uh, in this series, I'm going to be, today actually, I'm going to be looking at angels um, as part of the characters that are prominent in the Christmas story. Um, so we'd look at angels, we'd look at um, the wise men that came to see Jesus. We're going to be looking at the character that is Herod, who was king at the time that Jesus was born. We are going to be looking at Mary, the one that was to conceive and to give birth to Jesus. And then we would look at Joseph. Now, I'm hoping that at some point I would be able to um, smuggle one more character as a bonus as we go on. But I'll um, disclose that as we make progress. Definitely not today. Now, for this evening, for this first installment, I'm going to be looking at angels because when you look at that story, angel, it was an angel. The angel Gabriel was the one that brought the news that it is finally time for this prophecy that the fathers have believed and had uh, um, and looked forward to for so many centuries that it was now time for the prophecy to be fulfilled. So I think it's actually uh, fitting that we commence our consideration of these Christmas characters with looking at the character that is the angelic category. The first thing I want to say about this whole uh, category, this category that is the angelic category, is to say that the word angel is more of a designation of a job description. It's a, it's a job description much more than it is an identity marker. By that I mean that the word angel, malak in the Old Testament or uh, angelos in the New Testament uh, in the Greek, that word is simply the word messenger. It's, it's a job description. It does not necessarily identify. It does not necessarily have a strong ontological component, if any, at all. So that that word can be used of human persons. It can be used of spirit persons. And um, it can be used of uh, people in authority. It is simply a description of a job. So the word angel is the word the sent one or it is the word messenger. Now, in popular usage, however, every time that we invoke that word, there are memories that or there are ideas that are conjured in the minds of people. And that idea is basically the idea of spirit beings or a spirit entity that God might send. However, there are spirit entities and angels in that regard are part of that category of spirit entities. They are spirit beings, just like you have human beings. They are beings that are spirit in nature. Angels are part of that category. 
but you'd realize that things like cherubim uh, or seraphim um, are really not called angels, all right? There are other spirit beings that are not messenger beings. They are not messenger spirit entities or are not known to be sent on errands. And so the designation angel is almost never used for them. But the, the, the messenger entities that are spirit beings are generally called angels. And so every time we use that word angel, it is these entities that normally would come uh, in, up in the minds of people. And it is that category of spirit entities or spirit beings that I'm, I'm going to be dealing with today. Because the angel that is uh, prominent in the birth narrative of Jesus is actually a spirit being. Uh, starting with the angel Gabriel, who is identified by name as having visited Zacharias about six months months before visiting the uh, Mary who eventually went on to be the mother of Jesus. So today we are looking at angels. In looking at angels, therefore today, I'm going to be reading from Luke uh, chapter 1 and then I will also read from Luke's gospel chapter 2. Luke chapter 1, my reading will begin from the 26th verse. In the 16th month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. This is the ESV I'm reading from. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now, in Luke chapter 2 from verse 1, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Curidus was governor of Syria. And all went out to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because it was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel of the Lord said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So this is basically the um, two narratives that contain references to angelic visit. And I want to take a few minutes, the remainder of the time that I've got. I just want to take it to, uh, to talk to us a bit about the ministry of angels and the place of angels and the way that angels are represented in scripture since we are looking at these characters. So what can we say about angels? What can we say about the ministry of angels to believers in particular? So 
Angels are part of the players in the world that we also are called to be players. The this this this, this the realm of the spirit is a vast world that has a lot that is going on there. But angels are supposed to be our, our allies. They are supposed to be people that or entities that work side by side believers. So in negotiating our posture towards angels, we must avoid these extremes of either angel obsession or a complete lack of interest in the realms of angels and in the activities of angels. We must not engage in that kind of wholesale withdrawal from any contemplation of angels and the angelic order, just simply because the Bible is, has so much to say um, about angels. So while we must not be oblivious to the world of angels and to the activity of angels, there are a few things that we need to know. As believers, what we know for a fact is this. Angels are an integral part of the worlds we inhabit. That is, the physical world and the invisible world. We may not see them all the time, but our blindness to their presence does, n does nothing to the stubborn fact of their existence. Uh, the existence of angels does not depend on our intelligence or on our awareness. Angels are everywhere around us. The 34th Psalm asserts in part that the angel of the Lord surrounds those who fear him. In the grammar of the New Testament, the spiritual ecosystem within which the believer lives is populated in part by an innumerable company of angels. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews. But you see, our uh, uh, we have become very distant from their world, particularly after the fall of Adam and Eve. Yet, our ongoing experience as believers is supposed to be carried on um, within this world where you have angels, you have demons, you have seraphims, you have wheels, you have archangels, and all of that. All of these spirit categories, particularly the positive ones, are under the grand government of God. The thrills and the burdens of the spirit world where angels are domiciled, those are profound, and we are meant to profit by them. There's a disposition that enhances the possibility of that realm and its holy actors invading our consciousness. And by such invasion, our spiritual senses, now activated at the new birth, are trained to maximize the profundities of the luminous spirit landscape that angels call home. So, I know I've hinted at a certain propensity of believers to congregate at extremes of either angel obsession or uh, gross indifference to the reality of the angelic order. The subject of the authority structure in the spirit realm is also a hugely important one. And by that I mean, can a believer, for instance, command angels into action? Uh, do these instruments of God's providence, do they look up to us for instructions? Some Christians would say an unconditional yes. Others would say confident no. And I guess a significant demographic uh, of believers would be undecided. So while there's no section of the scripture that is devoted to a systematic uh, delivery on angels, we can make very informed uh, um, uh, um, conclusions from the data that we do have. So... Uh, to the question, do angels take instructions from believers? The simple answer I would give is no. There's no record in scripture of anyone sending angels on errands, not even our Lord himself during his earthly sojourn. You see, I think, and this is my informed uh, or studied position, that we may have been able to send angels on errand, maybe if humanity had not sinned in Adam and Eve but we fell. So when Daniel was explaining how he came to remain alive after he had spent a night with untamed lions in their underground cafeteria, he said, my God sent his angel and they shut the lion's mouth. Father Abraham in Genesis chapter 24 assured his servants that as he went to look for a wife for Isaac, that the project would be successful. He said, the Lord God would send his angel ahead of you 
and he will help you to get the right lady for Isaac. During the arrest of Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, he rebuked Peter for attempting to go physical in his defense. That is in defense of Jesus. So Jesus said to Peter, do you think I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? So Jesus said God could send these angels. Angels are answerable to God alone. We cannot command them. Not because we cannot articulate commands that are intended for angels to execute, but because even if we do so, we would be breaking a spirit protocol, the protocol for angelic operations. And such violation usually would just mean that the exercise would be unfruitful. And sometimes you might even be chastised. So just simply saying, I command angels to go and do this and that may make you feel good, uh, but it's not a very legitimate way to engage angels in the spirit. We are neither to command angels nor to contact God through them. Praying to or praying through them are unbiblical practices. There's no descriptive or prescriptive precedence in scripture to validate this kind of activity. So someone might therefore not be saying, so you are saying we cannot talk to angels or we cannot uh, command angels to do things for us. Does the Bible not say that they, um, they obey the word or they do his bidding and all of that? Yes. The point is this. Angels primarily respond to God and the Christian is supposed to be dealing with God. When we talk to the Lord, it is the Lord himself, therefore, that has the prerogative to dispatch angels. But when we interact with angels as believers, there are courtesies and disciplines and protocols that we need to know, that we need to observe, so that our engagement with angels will be fruitful. But even Jesus in his lifetime, when he was uh, here on earth, did not uh, uh, command angels around. He simply said, if I needed, I was going to talk to my father and then he will send his angels and they would come and bring ministry to me. So on the, on the one hand, we are saying that angels are a very important uh, part of uh, the world that God has called us to live in as believers. And so God sends angels to us. The Bible in Hebrews chapter 1 says that angels are ministering spirits and they are sent to minister to those that are heirs of salvation. They are sent to minister for those that are heirs of salvation. Their sender is God. Jesus did say he would send angels, but that is when he returns again. And at that time, he is not going to be just coming as a man. He is going to be coming as a king in all of his glory and in all of his beauty and in all of his majesty. So when Jesus is coming the next time, he's going to be coming and he actually says he will send his angels to the four corners of the earth. But while Jesus was on the earth the first time as a man, he did not command angels. He left that in the discretion of of his father. So what should the believer do? The position and responsibility of the believer is to talk to the father and then the father could dispatch angels. In fact, there are times when God would tell you what angels have been instructed to do. And so you can actually give expression to the fact that the angel of the Lord is in this place. And this is what the angel is about to do in this place because you have been so told. You know, when, when Paul was involved in that shipwreck towards the end of his ministry in Acts of the Apostles, the Bible says he eventually called the sailors and the captains and said, to them, um, it, this ship is going to be fine. Uh, this ship is not going to be fine, but everybody on the ship is going to be fine. We are going to lose the vessel, but there will be no loss of life because the God whom I serve and whose I am sent his angel to me in the course of the night. And the angel said to me that there will be no loss of life. And so Paul concluded by saying, and I believe that it shall even be as it was said unto me, by the Lord. The angel of the Lord encamps around them uh, that fear him. So on and on we see in scripture that God gives angels responsibility uh, in the life of his people, but 
that's exactly what it is. It is God giving them responsibility over the lives of his people. How do we uh, work with angels? How do we partner with angels if they are our allies? It is simply to acknowledge their presence. It is simply to understand that uh, they exist, right? Is to understand that they exist and then to be able to uh, 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 um, partner with them in terms of uh, if, for instance, an angel brings you an instruction, it is for you to recognize the legitimacy of that kind of oppression. And then sometimes also it constitutes in expecting, expecting their ministry, expecting their service. You can even ask the Lord to send angels, right? Because that was what Jesus said, that he could ask his father and then the father was going to send an angel. So, you, you you can ask the Lord, like, Lord, will you please send us some messengers? Could, could you give us some reinforcement uh, in this scenario? We need help, we, we need hands, or we need reinforcement uh, uh, overhead in this situation. So it is to know that these angels exist. They exist in order to work for us and to work with us. And so whenever they show up, for us to be able to respond to them with a courtesy that is appropriate to their persons, um, and then sometimes to simply acknowledge that they are around us. That consciousness of their presence many times is very, very important because sometimes if you are not, you may not be able to fully take advantage of their ministry. And so um, it's, a, it's a bit of a delicate one, I know, but the simple point is we do not have biblical precedence for believers sending angels on errand However, there's a lot of biblical precedence for the, to the fact that angels are sent on errand for believers, all right? So they are sent, they are simply sent by God. It is God that sends his angels. It is the Lord himself that sends angels so that they can minister for the benefit of believers. We are servants of God in a sense, and angels are also servants of God, which means in that service category, we are more like uh, colleagues, all right? We are more like colleagues in that realm, but ultimately we do know that there's a hierarchy. And in that hierarchy, the Bible says that we will, we will judge angels. We will judge angels. So there's gonna be a time that comes in the future when the believer is actually going to fully attain to all of his privileges in grace and in God. And at that time, we will have a hierarchical advantage or superiority, if you like, over angels. But right now, the example that we see principally in the life of Jesus himself is that in this current form of existence, in this current frame of things, angels do not take instructions from believers. But angels are giving instructions on account of believers. We don't pray to angels. We don't pray through angels. We do not uh, uh, send angels around. But when we pray in response to our prayers, God dispatches his angels because they are sent. It's just that their sender is not man. They are sent by God to minister on account of the welfare and the well-being of those that are heirs. Of salvation and that was exactly what we saw in the passage that we have read how that God sent an angel the angel Gabriel was sent onto the city of Galilee uh, to a lady that was named Mary and this is how this whole story began in human history it was through the instrumentality of an angel that had been sent to a certain young lady that was where the process of the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy that men of old anticipated began. It began with an angel bringing information to Mary. And when Jesus was eventually born, we saw angels also appearing to shepherds who were taking care of their flock by night. When I talk about the shepherds um, um, in conjunction with the wise men, uh, I'm going to be looking at the fact that when God wanted to speak to the wise men, God spoke to them by the voice of the constellation. They saw a star in the, uh, uh, in the constellation. When God was going to speak to the shepherds, God spoke to them through the instrumentality of angels. Okay? 
So these are different languages that God employs in speaking to his people. There are people that that's the language that they understand, the language of nature. There are people that the language that they understand is the supernatural, is the language of the unseen realm. Um, there are people that the language that they understand is the language of academia. God is able to speak to everybody in their own language. And um, as a final lesson, I would also say that on the day of Pentecost, it was demonstrated by God that God God intends that believers are also able to speak in the language of their audience, in the language of their audience. And by language, I'm not just talking about uh, uh, verbal sequences. I'm basically using that word in the broadest possible sense, that there are people that the language that they understand is intellectual. There are people that the language that they understand is the language of the supernatural. There are people that the language that they understand is the language of science. The point is, on the day of Pentecost, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, God intends that his people will be able to communicate to the world in the language that the world would understand so that different parts of the members of the body of Christ should be um, would be empowered by the spirit of God to be able to attend to a particular demography of society in the language that that demography of society understands there are people for instance that the language they understand is politics and there must be segments of the church that is able to speak that language because we have this example from God himself God spoke to the wise men in the language that they understood and God spoke to shepherds in the language that shepherds would understand. God used the angels to get the attention of shepherds and God used a star in the constellation in the constellation to get the attention of astrologers because that's what these wise men as we now call them that's what they were they were astrologers so they understood the language of the of the skies the language of the constellation and God used that to get their attention so today we look at angels and then we continue uh, tomorrow to look at one of the six characters that I want to consider around the Christmas story. So till I come your way again tomorrow, uh, if you have any comment, please do leave it in the, uh, in the comment section. You have a question, do leave it in the comment section. I'm sure there would be quite a number of questions, just simply because I have said today that uh, Christians are not biblically legitimized to command angels to send them on errand. But remember, I have said that we talk to the Lord and the Lord himself has the duty of sending angels to do ministry on our account. And we have the responsibility of partnering with these angels. We do that by recognizing their presence, by responding to uh, their messages like we saw in the case of Mary. And we could also look at the case of uh, uh, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. Uh, but we are not to personally command them to go do things. That is what Jesus does. That is what the Father does. When the Father gives them that instruction and we are alerted to that detail, then we cannot play along with it. And so sometimes you see, uh, you hear God say to you that there are angels coming to this place and they are bringing this and this and this. And then what you do as a human person is to give expression to what the Lord has said. To say, wow, God has sent his angels into this place and those angels are going to be doing this and they are going to be doing that and they are going to be doing this. These are the ways that we cooperate with the ministry of angels. So if you have any question, please do leave them in the comment section. It would help uh, if you like this video, it will just help to give it greater uh, uh, um, publicity so that more people can join in the series of this teaching as we run through Christmas characters, as we celebrate Christmas this year 2021 if you are not subscribed to the channel i'd also encourage you to just click the subscribe button there and uh, also the notification bell so that every time a video goes up on this channel you will receive a notification in your email till i come your way again tomorrow the lord bless you and i think it's not a bad time to already say merry christmas thank you <music>